zanneden. Eğitimi yapma zekanı kullanımı ve olası güçlükler başlıklı etkinliğimize hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Ben adına hepinize hoş geldiniz diyerek sözlerime başlamak istiyorum. Türkiye Eğitim Derneği'nin kıymetli bir parçası olan düşünce kuruluşumuz TEDMEN. Yine birçok önemli ismi bir arayla Türkiye'de buluşturduğu gibi bugün de çok kıymetli bir hocamızı sizlerle oluşturuyor. Ee, bu önemli girişimlerden dolayı öncelikle sayın misafirimize, e, I think they are translating kadar, e, hoş geldiniz diyorum. Sizlere de hoş geldiniz diye sözlerime başlamak istiyorum. Yazılım, kodlama, siber güvenlik gibi pek çok alana etki eden yapay zeka eğitim öğretim uygulamalarında da kendini gösterir hale geldi. Buradan yola çıkarak dünyanın en önde gelen üniversitelerinden biri olan MIT, yapay zeka fakültesi kurmak için çalışmalarına başladığını söyledi. Sonuçta teknoloji kaçınılmaz bir gerçeklik. Medeniyetlerin yol almasında, insanlığın kendine yol açmasında olmazsa olmaz etkenlerinin başında geliyor. Ancak akıllardaki sorulardan biri, yapay zeka teknoloji ve teknolojisi meslekleri yok mu ediyor gibi bir soruyla karşı karşıyayız. Forbes dergisinde yer alan bir araştırmada 2051 yılında kadar insanların yaptığı tüm görevlerin 2136 yılına kadar da insanların yaptığı tüm mesleklerin yapay zeka tarafından e, yerine getirebileceği söyleniyor. Yani bu soru insanların mesleklerine dair korkularından yola çıkan bir soru haline dönüşmüş vaziyette. Şu anda neredeyse tüm büyük teknoloji şirketleri yapay zeka projeleri üzerinde çalışıyorlar. Ünlü fizikçi Stephen Hanway, yapay zeka ile ilgili geleceğe ilişkin öngörüsü dikkate alınmalı. Çünkü diyordu ki, yapay zekalı makineler insan ırkının sonunu getirebilir. Aslına baktığınız zaman şahsi düşüncem de, belki hep bizlerin küçüklüğünde uzay yolu filmini seyrettiğimiz zaman ne güzel hayal kurmuşlar derdik, bugün o hayallerin oluştuğunu görüyoruz. Umuyorum ki insanoğlu kendi kendini yok etmede, Üstad değildir, uzman değildir. Şüphesiz ki teknolojiden faydalanmalı. Şüphesiz ki yaşamı e, kolaylaştırmalı. Ama yaşamı kolaylaştırıyorum derken yaşamı yok etme riskini de göz önünde bulundurmak mecburiyetinde olduğunu düşünün. Unutmamız lazım. Çünkü bugün baktığımız zaman dünyada tartışılan önemli şeylerden bir tanesi duyarsız nesilliği tartışıyoruz dünyada. Yani teknolojiyle tamamen sosyalleşmeyi teknoloji üzerinden gerçekleştiren kinestetikliği yok etmiş, ortadan birbirine dokunmayan, uzaktan eğitimlerin bile çok daha yüz eğitimden ön plana çıktığı bir nesli tartışıyoruz. Ve bencilleşen bir nesli tartışıyoruz. O zaman e, duygusallıktan uzaklaşan bir nesli tartışıyoruz. Aslında insan olmanın en büyük özelliklerinden ve en büyük nimetlerinden biri olmak, acı çekmek ve e, haz duymak gibi duygulardan uzaklaştığımızı tartışıyoruz. Eğer tabii bunlar zaman içerisinde <gülüyor> makinaların e, kontrolüne ve belki bize benzeyecek, tamamen bizim gibi olacak yapılara dönüşürse bu risk insanoğlunun kendi kendini yok etmesiyle karşı karşıya kalabilir. Şüphesiz ki başka bir riskle daha karşı karşıyayız. Birkaç e, ırk sonra kaç tane olduğunu hiçbirimiz bilmiyoruz. Dünya bu nüfus taşıyamadığı için yaşayan neslin ciddi bir kısmının yok olması gerekiyor. Aslında bölgemize çıkan her savaşta benim içimden bir ses Acaba bu nüfus azaltılması Orta Doğu'dan mı başladı gibi bir tereddütle beni karşı karşıya bırakıyor. Şüphesiz ki artık Mars'ta hayat aş yaşam aranıyor ve gayret sarf ediliyor. Tabii ki bunun gerekçesinin bir tanesi dünya neslinin dünyanın taşıyabileceğinden çok daha fazla bir sayıya gelmesi olabilir. Ama ikincisi de bir gün makineler insan ırkını yok ederse belki Mars'taki insanlar veya uzayda başka yerlerde yaşayacak insanlar bunun daha ileri bir noktaya gitmesini engelleyip orada yeniden bir neslin ve ırkın doğuşunu sağlayabilirler, olabilirler diye düşünüyorum. İşte tam bu noktada bizler sanırım duygularımızla, insani değerlerimizle ve sosyal etkileşimlerimize odaklanmak mecburiyetindeyiz. En çok şefkat kavramı üzerinde durmalıyız. 
Evet, makineler ürkütücü bir şekilde ilerliyor. Ancak empati, duygular ya da anlayış gibi konularda insanlardan gerideler. Ama bugün için gerideler. Yarının ne olacağını hiçbirimiz bilmiyoruz. Bunun için öncelikle eğitim sistemimizi doğru şekillendirmemiz ve eğitimcilerimizin iyi yönlendirmemiz gerektiği kanısındayım. Yapay zeka öğretmenlerin yerine alabilir mi diye düşünüyorum. Aslında baktığınız zaman dünyadaki hemen hemen her meslek işe giderim gidiyorum derken öğretmenler okula gidiyorum der. Öğretmen öğrenci ile öğretmenin arasında koyduğu bir duygu bağıdır aslında. Öğretme kanalını açması, köklüyü kurması o kurabildiği bir duyguyla alakalıdır. Her şey insanda, her şey insanın duygularında başlar. İnsan insanın gölgesinde yetişiyor deniyor. Çok doğru. Eğitimde dünya üzerindeki gelişmeler tabii ki iyi analiz edilip ta takip edilecektir. Ancak dünya insanı yetiştirirken duygusuz nesile giden yoldan dönülmesi de şart olduğunu unutmak mecburiyetinde unutmamamız gerekiyor. Bugün e, Sayın Lankin e, sanıyorum zaten yapay zeka ve insanlar arasındaki duygu temelli farklı değinecektir. Onun için son bir şeyle konuşmamı tamamlamak istiyorum. Aslında yapay zeka ile ilgilenenlerin e, biz Lazları da e, incelemesi gerektiğini inanıyorum. Çünkü biliyorsunuz biz Lazlar beyne ihtiyacı olmadan öğleden sonra bile e, başarılı olabiliyoruz. Geçen sene düzenlemiş bir eğitim ve beyin toplantısında e, katılımcıların hepsi çok büyük kazanımlar elde etmişti. Ben edemedim maalesef. Çünkü beyinle kısmındaki farkı e, şeyi e, oluşturamadık kendim. Ee, onu da incelerlerse belki e, zekayı beyni olmadan da ihtiyaç olmadan götürülebildiğini görürler diye düşünüyorum. Umuyorum ki bugün burada olmaktan mutlu olursunuz. Değerli konuğumuzun sizlere vereceği, paylaşacağı bilgiler bu tereddütlerimizle ilgili e, açıklayıcı oldu, açıklayıcı oldu kanaatindeyim. Hepinize hoş geldiniz diyorum, saygılar sunuyorum. Beşincisinde de bizi yalnız bırakmadınız. Hepinizi saygıyla selamlıyorum. Ee, biz TEDMEM olarak aslında şöyle bir fikirle yola çıktık TEDMEM kürsüyü başlatırken. Eğitimin güncel konuları yanında geleceğe dönük olarak da konularla ilgili bir e, diyalog başlatmak, bir takım soruları sorabilmek, bazı eski soruları yeniden sorabilmek gibi bir e, hareket noktasından çıktık ve bugün geldiğimiz noktada beşincisini yapıyoruz bu e, etkinliğimizin. Tedmem olarak genelde e, biz ülkemizin sorunları ile ilgili, eğitim sorunları ile ilgili politika önerileri geliştirmeye çalışıyoruz. Bunu yaparken de her zaman bunu veriye ve bilgiye dayalı olarak yapmaya çalışıyoruz. Tabii e, eğitim politikaları dediğimizde işin içinde yine politika sözcüğü var ama bunu yaparken kesinlikle e, günlük siyasi tartışmaların ya da günlük e, politik argümanların içinde değil, eğitimin teorisiyle ve eğitimin eğitim bilimlerinin bugüne kadar ürettiği bilgiyle hareket etmeye çalışıyoruz. E, bu bağlamda da e, bugünkü çalışmayı geleceğe dönük olarak bizim ele almamız gereken konulardan e, biri olarak gördük, önemsedik. Biz Tedmem Kürsü çalışmaları sonrasında genellikle e, bu çalışmanın devamını da getiriyoruz. Yani bu çalışmayla kalmıyor. Örneğin bir önceki çalışmada biz e, e, mobiliyeti konusunu, hareketlilik konusunu ele aldık. Orada hem gelir e, hareketliliği kuşaklar arasında hem de eğitim hareketliliği vardı. Onun sonrasında hemen bir e, çalıştay yaptık. Yine akademisyenlerin de katılımıyla, çeşitli paydaşların katılımıyla e, bazı STK'ların da katılımı oldu. Ve bunun sonu aslında da politika önerileri geliştirip bunları e, sizlerle <gülüyor> oyuyla paylaşmaya çalışacağız. Bugünkü çalışma da aslında bir başlangıç olarak görebileceğimiz bir çalışma. Bugün yapay zekanın kullanım alanlarına baktığınızda hemen hemen her alanda kendini gösteriyor. Tedarik zincirlerinden tutun da uzay çalışmalarına kadar tıpta birçok alanda yapay zeka teknolojisinin kullanıldığını görüyoruz. Eğitimde kullanımı başlıyor. Özellikle biz eğitimin bireyselleştirilmesi ve demokratikleşmesinden söz ediyorsak bu elimizde olan çok güçlü bir teknoloji olacak. 
Ama aynı zamanda bu teknolojiyi kullanmanın güçlükleri de olacak ve bu teknolojiyi kullanırken biz e, bir takım e, zorluklarda ve bir takım tehditlerle de karşılaşacağız. Tabii bunlara girmeyeceğim. Bunlar e, konuğumuz e, Rosemary Lucky'nin biraz sonra üzerinde duracağı konular. E, ama bizim önümüzdeki döneme baktığımızda Dünya Ekonomik Forumunda geçen yıl yapılan bir tahminde e, şöyle bir rakamla karşılaşıyoruz. 2022 yılı itibariyle yani önümüzdeki 5 yıldan söz ediyoruz. 4 yıldan şu an için. Bu 4 yılda e, teknoloji yoğun ki bunların bir kısmında e, yapay zeka teknolojisi de söz konusu alanlardaki yeni istihdam 133 milyon civarında olacak yaklaşık dünyada. Ama diğer taraftan da geleneksel işlere baktığımızda bu geleneksel işlerde sekreterlik ya da yönetici asistanlığı ya da e, rutin bir takım ofis işleri gibi işlere baktığımızda burada da 75 milyon civarında bir azalma olacak. Aslında toplamda baktığınızda istihdamda bir daralma, iş güç piyasasında bir daralma söz konusu değil. Ama işlerin niteliği değişiyor. Dolayısıyla eğitimin önünde geleceğe dönük olarak baktığımızda iki tane temel sorun var. Birisi hali hazırda iş gücüne katılmış olan yetişkin nüfusun bu transformasyonunu sağlamak. Teknolojiyi kullanan transformasyonunu sağlamak. İkincisi ise yeni yetişen kuşağı, yani hali hazırda örgün eğitimin içinde olan kuşağı, bu teknolojiyi kullanabilecek, o teknolojinin becerisinden söz etmiyorum. O teknolojiyi kullanabilecek, üretebilecek, geliştirebilecek e, temel yetkinliklere, temel yeterliklere sahip olması. Şimdi bu ikisini birlikte gerçekleştirmek çok e, ciddi bir güçlük ama bunun için de özellikle e, yetişkin nüfusun e, bu işler arasındaki transformasyonuna, dönüşümüne baktığımızda burada çok daha hızlı, çok daha esnek yapıların olması gerekiyor. Tabii eğitim öğretimle ilgili belki de birçok şeyi sorgulamamız gerekiyor. Örneğin, yazma becerisi, klavye becerisi artık o kadar önemli mi? Ya da e, şöyle düşünelim, hatta yabancı dil öğrenmede bile bizim geleneksel olarak kullandığımız yöntemler ya da geleneksel olarak yabancı dil öğrenme artık ee, önümüzdeki 3 yılda, 5 yılda, 10 yılda hala anlamlı olacak mı? Çünkü teknoloji şu anda bizim için bu çeviriyi yapıyor. Eğer tane tane düzgün konuşursanız, belirli bir hızda konuşursanız konuştuklarınızı yazıyor. Yanlış olanların altını çiziyor, size bir de uyarı yapıyor, gösteriyor. Şimdi burada baktığımızda çok basit düzeyde e, kullanımından söz ediyoruz ama daha ileri düzeyde kullanımına baktığımızda az önce de ifade ettiğim gibi ulaşımdan çok farklı alanlara kadar kullanım var. Peki eğitimde bizim önümüzdeki zorluk ne Türkiye olarak? Bir kez e, sistemi ve eğitim öğretimin günlük işleyişini regüle eden, düzenleyen bir takım e, yapıları gözden geçirmek zorunda kalacağız. Örneğin biz öğretmenlere diyoruz ki ders kitapları dışında başka materyal e, e, kitap kullanamazsınız. Peki, yapay zekanın işin içine girdiği yerde bireyselleştirilmiş öğrenmenin, hiper bireyselleştirilmiş öğrenmenin olduğu yerde bu kontrolü nasıl sağlayacaksınız? Böyle bir kontrol hala anlam taşıyor. Burada pek çok yönüyle bugün ülke uygulamalarımızı gözden geçirmemiz gerekiyor. Ee, ama bir taraftan da e, şunu da günlük olarak baktığımızda ya da kısa vadede baktığımızda şunu da gözden kaçırmamamız gerekiyor. Ee, geçen yılki ISO 500 raporuna baktığınızda imarat sektöründe e, yüksek teknoloji ve orta yüksek teknoloji kullanarak üretilen e, toplam çıktının toplam üretim içindeki payına baktığınızda oldukça küçük, küçük bir pay tutuyor. Dolayısıyla hala daha geleneksel yollarla üretim ya da e, daha düşük ya da orta e, düzeydeki teknolojiyle üretimde devam ediyor. Bir taraftan da bu insanı yetiştirmek zorunda. Yani bizim bugün yetiştirdiğimiz insanların hepsi yapay zekayı kullanmayacak. Ki buradaki becerilerin bir kısmının transfer edilebilir olduğunu göz önünde bulundurursak, e, bu ülke eğitim öğretimimizi piyasa dengesiyle, toplumsal ihtiyaçlar, toplumsal kalkınma dengesiyle de e, bir gözden geçirip, bu konuları e, geniş bir e, politika e, diyaloğu içinde tartışmamız gerekiyor. Ben e, sözlerimi burada ara verip sözü Rozlakin Hanımefendi'ye bırakmak istiyorum. Tekrar hoş geldiniz diyorum. Saygılar sunuyorum. Thank you very much. And thank you for those very
insightful comments. I agree, compassion is so important, and no artificial intelligence has any compassion. And I agree, it's about broader policy perspectives. And it's wonderful, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's lovely to be invited to a community that's trying to embrace the changes that need to happen because we have artificial intelligence. And I hope that I can provide some useful information that will help in your thinking as you move forward for this think tank. For this think tank. So thank you for the distinguished program, director, guests, and teachers, educators, students. It's wonderful to be here. This is the first time I've ever been to Turkey. And it's wonderful and I'm loving it. So thank you very much indeed. So I want to talk to you today about the potential of artificial intelligence, but also some of the challenges that it brings, particularly for education and training. Because I believe there's so much that we can do that's of benefit when it comes to education through using artificial intelligence. But I also think there are challenges that we have to address as well, and we need to recognize those challenges if we're going to get the best we can from the fact that we have these very intelligent technologies. So, first of all, before I launch into the potential and the challenges, I thought it might be useful to actually say something about what artificial intelligence is. Because we all talk about it, but we don't all necessarily know exactly what we're talking about, and perhaps we're not talking about the same thing. So I thought I'd start with a basic what is artificial intelligence? So, usually when I ask people what you think artificial intelligence is, I get an answer that's probably something like this. A robot, or something from the movies, or a Siri type, or an Alexa type, voice activated interface. These tend to be the sorts of things that people think of when they think of artificial intelligence. But actually, <coughs> artificial intelligence is about intelligence. Most definitions of artificial intelligence define it in terms of human intelligence, which is understandable because we've built artificial intelligence in our image. Because it's our intelligence that we understand. Although, by the end of today, I hope I might have persuaded you that perhaps we don't understand quite enough about our own intelligence yet, and there's still a lot that we need to understand. But in principle, artificial intelligence is about the study of intelligence. Because if we don't understand intelligence, how can we automate it? So I'm going to give you a little bit of a brief history of artificial intelligence, but I want you to hold in your heads as I do this the notion that artificial intelligence is about a lot more than the technology we see today. They're just the tools that implement the current version of artificial intelligence. And I want you to think about it as something that can help us to solve really difficult problems. But we can only solve those problems if we understand those problems and work out how we combine artificial and human intelligence together to solve those problems. So starting off with a bit of history, if we think about robots, the first use of the word robot that I could find was in a play by a Czech playwright. And of course it was a dystopian play. And you can see these humans playing robots looking terribly serious because the robots have come to end the world and it's all terribly grim and sad. But actually, if you look to the side, there are some more modern notions of robots. And they're not all dystopian. We have very useful robots that help in car production, for example. So not all robots are bad, but they certainly existed before we had the machine versions of robots. They existed in fantasy, in play, much as they do in Hollywood today. But if we get to the serious stuff, then 1940 was about the start of real cybernetics with Norbert Weiner. We've had automaton for many, many years, but the real start of robotics was born around 1940 with Norbert Weiner, who started looking at animal control and communication. And then, in the 50s, we had Alan Turing, who was a very famous British mathematician who proposed the idea that a machine, a computer, 
could behave in a way that could be thought of as intelligent. But actually, the real start of artificial intelligence was about 62 years ago. In 1956, about 10 academics got together at Dartmouth College in the US and they came up with this statement. And I've underlined the pieces that I think are particularly interesting. The study is to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. And I think that's important. A machine can be made to simulate it. It's not the same as being it. Simulating it's not the same as being it. But that every feature of learning could be automated. And even more astounding, we think that a significant advance can be made in one of these problems if carefully selected group of scientists work on it together for a summer. So, we were going to solve a significant part of intelligence over a summer with 10 people. And that was genuinely the start of the Dartmouth College work in 1956. Now, one of the very, very early artificial intelligence systems, so this is 1964, so a few years later, this is called ELISA, and it was built by a scientist called Joseph Weizenbaum, and it's pretending to be a psychotherapist. So this is a speech interface. This is what, for, for the younger members of the audience, this is what the computer interface was like many, many years ago. <laughs> you would type something in and you would get a typed answer back. So in this little dialogue, the technology, the machine is saying, I am the psychotherapist. Please describe your problems. And you would type in your problem. And this, I've picked this dialogue particularly. This particular problem is, I have a headache. It's not the kind of thing you go to a psychotherapist with. Maybe you could shoot and talk to a doctor of medicine. I'm a psychotherapist. Oh, I'll do that then. Can you elaborate on that? And this is where the dialogue starts to fall apart, because the human has said, I'll do that then. And the system is trying to analyse that as a psychotherapist would. And then we go on to, uh, I say, as the human, what are you talking about? No, I cannot elaborate on that. Um, why do you say that? said the psychotherapist. And then, now you're just talking nonsense, says the humans. What makes you believe that now I am talking nonsense? And you can see immediately how it's not intelligent at all. And of course what it is, is a rule-based system, a system of pattern matching. So when we type in certain words, the computer computes and matches those words to a canned sentence that it slots in the words that it's analysed. So you can see down the bottom, you know, the words, now you're just talking nonsense from the input phrase from me, could be matched to a rule that would be, if you're XXS, then what makes you believe that I am? So if you've said this, the psychotherapist can come back and say, what makes you think whatever the human has said? It's very simple. When I first studied at university, artificial intelligence, um, I uh, was asked to write an ELISA-like programme. It was a standard task for artificial intelligence students. And I wrote a politician. Because I thought politicians are very good at repeating the question in their answer. And that actually you could write a politician. We could do that. It was quite fun. But moving on. So as we moved through 70s, 80s, we came up with quite good expert systems. These were still rule-based pattern matching. But they were quite good for basic medical diagnosis. And this looked like we were doing quite well in AI stakes. But the key thing to remember about all these early examples is the machine does not learn. The machine has a set of rules and it applies those rules, which means it's fixed when the programmer builds it. What happened with the breakthrough a few years ago now, but in particular last year, with at the end of last year, with Google DeepMind's AlphaGo system, was that we saw the amazing things that can happen when you have machines that can learn. And that's the fundamental difference. No longer did you need to write all the rules in advance. What you were going to create was a machine that could learn. And I'll say something about exactly how that learning happens in just a minute. 
And that means that it can seem like magic. Because there we have Lisa Dole, master world champion go player, with his head in his hands as he realises he's going to lose. And that encapsulates an amazing stride forward for artificial intelligence. Go is a very complex game, and here we are, we had a machine that could learn and had learnt to play better Go than Lisa Dole. Better being used here to describe the way that we were evaluating that game. Now there are people who would say, well if you think of Go differently, and you think of Go as a cultural artifact, if you think of it as something whereby people have had conversations over the centuries, you might question whether he did win or not, whether he, sorry, whether AlphaGo did win or not. But we'll leave that aside for the moment. In terms of winning the game, AlphaGo won. And now I say, well, let's look at Google DeepMind. So Google DeepMind built the AlphaGo system. And here is their philosophy. This is their mission. They are going to solve intelligence and use it to solve everything else. Does that remind you of anything? I think it's very like this. 62 years ago, the smartest people in the world, or some of the smartest people in the world, really thought that over a summer, we could understand enough about learning that we could automate a significant part of it and understand it in a way that we could automate it and simulate it. Now that sounds ridiculously arrogant, but at the time that was genuinely what people believed. And of course, we didn't. And I would say that I think we're at risk of doing the same again. We have built amazingly smart machines, but they are smart in a very particular sort of a way. And that's what we really need to understand in order to work out what the potential and the challenges of AR. AI is, particularly for education and training. So there's a sort of cliche that I hear said a lot at the moment, and that is that data is the new oil. So why is data so important? And why might we think of it as the new oil? Data is so important because data is what helps a machine learning algorithm to learn. So the difference between those early artificially intelligent systems that were rule-based and the systems that power things like AlphaGo are that these new systems are called machine learning systems. And machine learning is in the same way that my grandson is learning to write and practices and trains on the letters again and again and again. We do the same with our machine learning systems. We have an algorithm, or a rule, if you like, a meta rule that learns from the data that it's trained on. So we give these machine learning algorithms lots and lots and lots of examples, and when they match something correctly, they get rewarded, and when they don't, they don't get rewarded. And when I say rewarded, it's to do with increasing the weights on the network that is doing the machine learning. So I will explain that again in a minute, but basically data is important because data is what trains our machine learning algorithms. And that's why people talk about data being the new oil. But like data, like oil rather, data is crude. Data is meaningless until it's analysed. So the power is in the way that we train our algorithms with the data. And that might mean the data that we select for the training, and it might mean the way that we write the algorithm that trains the machine learning to recognize what we want from the data. So for example, when I arrive at an airport with my e-passport, I can put my e-passport in the gate. I put my photograph down on the screen and I stand in front of the camera. Now, an artificially intelligent system is working behind the scenes to say, does the photograph in this passport and the information in this passport match to the face that I'm seeing in front of the camera? And there's a tolerance of error because I might look tired today, I might have had a haircut, 
I might have aged a few years since my passport photograph. But are there enough features that are the same that we can match that we'll say yes? That's machine learning. And that will have been trained on thousands of millions of photographs to work out which points in the face are the points that are the ones that are most likely to lead to a reliable match. If you think about that in a legal system, if you think about the job of a paralegal, it's generally going through thousands and thousands of documents looking for a particular phrase. Again, that's something that machine learning can be trained to do very effectively to look for a very specific piece of information amongst thousands and millions of other pieces of information. So very useful, very smart, but in a very particular sort of way. So data is absolutely important, but it's not much use on its own. We need to analyze it, and we need to analyze it in useful ways. So if we think about the current situation, the reason that artificial intelligence is now making so much more impact on the world than it did in 1964 or 1974 or 1984 is because we have a perfect storm. We have very powerful computing technology that can memorize, can store lots and lots and lots of data and can store lots of programs that can process that data. We have very good well-designed <coughs> machine learning algorithms that can be trained on that data. And therefore, we can now do things that we couldn't do before. So it's not just that we've built good machine learning algorithms. It's not just that we've got lots of data. It's not just that we've got lots of computing power, lots of cloud storage. It's just that they've all come together now. And that means we can do things now that I can even dream about. I can remember, if you wanted to run any kind of program of any size when I was an undergraduate, you had to run it overnight. We could do that in a split second now. It's a huge difference. So it's, it's that that's made the difference. But essentially, what you need to remember is that the smartest AI we now have is still just pattern matching. It's still learning from masses and masses of data to match between things to say, do I want to do this? Do I want to recognize this as a face or this as a dog? Do I want to recognize this as this person's face or not? Is this sentence the sentence I'm looking for in this document? It's very sophisticated, but essentially, it's still pattern matching. Right, so that's part one. That's the basics of artificial intelligence to kind of get us in the right place. So AI is the ability to accomplish complex goals. That's true. Um, that can't be measured by a single IQ. Um, but real intelligence is intelligence across a whole spectrum of things. So if we had artificial general intelligence, or abbreviated to AGI, which we do not have at the moment, then yes, we would have machines that could accomplish any cognitive task, just as we can if we learn. But today, what we have is AI systems that are very narrow and very specific. So they can do really smart things, but very particular smart things. The e-passport gate at the airport can't play chess. The chess playing machine can't recognize my face in a photograph. AlphaGo can play AlphaGo, but it couldn't make a souffle. Do you see what I mean? It's, it's very specific, it's very narrow. And yes, it can accomplish quite complex goals, like playing with own, but just that subset of complex goals. What AI cannot do, as well as not being compassionate, which is absolutely right, it does not understand itself. So if you think about humans, if I say to you, where have you been this morning? I don't think any of you would have any problem in answering that question and saying it to me and, and, and, and helping me to understand it. What do you know about AI? You might know nothing, but you know you know nothing. Or you know you know a little bit. Or you know you know a lot. Or you think you know a lot. Um, how well do you understand quantum physics? Here? Not much. Somebody out there? Probably a lot. But we have an idea, and we can answer that. <coughs> how are you feeling right now? AI will struggle enormously 
with answering those questions. Even if it knows lots about quantum physics, it won't necessarily know it knows in the sense that we do. So that understanding of ourselves is fundamentally important to human intelligence. And it's something that artificial intelligence really struggles with. And this is why DARPA in the US are investing huge amounts of money in what is called explainable AI to try and help build systems that can understand themselves, that can justify making a decision. Because it's all very well having artificial intelligence that we can ask to make difficult decisions. But if it can't explain why it's made a decision or justify that decision, it's actually very limited in its usefulness. So, my key point one is artificial intelligence is intelligent in a particular sort of a way. No doubt, it's intelligent. Humans are intelligent in many ways. So artificial intelligence and human intelligence are not the same, and the differences are really important. And I think this is the area that a lot of people working in AI, building these amazing technologies, are not necessarily understanding enough about, which is why we end up with systems that are put into practical use, like Amazon's recruitment system, and then suddenly we realize that actually it only recruits male applicants because it's been trained on male applications. So, you know, we need to think things through more before we start using AI in many instances. So now, to the possibilities of AI for education and training. So, this diagram is really the thing that underpins what I'm going to say, because I think this is what needs to happen in a one slide version for artificial intelligence to be used intelligently in education and training. Go away and find a subset of resources for you or your students, but will then convert them into activities as well. But mostly it's just going away and finding from masses of content what's useful for you or your students. And these things are out there and widely available. We then have something like a Lello, which is slightly different, and this is where I'm hoping that my little video will play, but we'll see if the technology will work for me. Let's try it. Part of what makes it very easy for people to access is that it just runs in any web browser on any device that basically supports a microphone. A student in Peru, if they want to learn English, they pull up their laptop or their tablet, they bring up a web browser, they connect, to uh, the Enskill Sim server, and then up comes a role play simulation, character on the up screen, and then they can just start talking with that character and respond. What do you do for fun? I spend a lot of time playing sports. Where do you play soccer? Sometimes I go to Super Sports 7 over on Center Street. As learners are interacting with Enskill, it's constantly collecting data of what responses the learners are giving. And so we use that data to continuously retrain and improve the AI. It's really been a game changer, this ability to collect data and then use it to, uh, to improve the performance of the platform. And that's the key thing. It's a nice interface, it's a conversational interface. The conversations are individualized, but the system goes on learning all the time. The more students it works with, the better it gets. And that's a real game changer. But it still can only do the language conversation. It's not doing everything. It's very specific. So key point two, artificial intelligence can help us solve some of the biggest challenges in education. Providing individualized tutoring for students that's struggling can really make a difference to how well they perform. And not least, it can help to build their confidence. And of course, that's hugely important. For the first time in the history of the world, we could educate everybody. We've never been able to do that before. But whether it's because we provide AI tutors or because we enable everyone to have a human tutor, even if that human tutor is located somewhere else in the world, and the AI is helping to power that to make sure those tutors are increasing in their ability to tutor, we could actually do that. That is the possibility of AI for education and training. And I find that mind blowing. As an educator, I find that really exciting. As a scientist, I find it exciting too. As a parent and a grandparent, I find it slightly scary. <laughs> um, and I 
think we do need to be aware that there are some challenges in there. But the possibilities are huge. And that's really worth fighting for. So, part three. Yes, solving some of the challenges. But first, we need to think about educational capacity. Because it's all very well me saying this, but how many educators in Turkey, how many educators in the UK, how many educators anywhere actually feel confident they understand enough about artificial intelligence to use it effectively? Probably not that many. I think you could ask the same question about educational technology in general, to be fair. And increasingly, educational technology companies will be using AI techniques within their technologies. It's a huge problem. In the UK, it's been a problem for many years. We have small pockets of groups of teachers who use technology really, really well. But in general, we still have a capacity. And that's where these two outer sections of my diagram are so, so important. And one way we're tackling this is through a, problem called, uh, through a program called Educate. So we started this program called Educate um, 18 months ago. We took our first cohort of people on our program in June 2017, so slightly less than 18 months ago. And Educate is built on this foundation. It's what I call the golden triangle. And the golden triangle is golden because it's all about evidence. It's all about understanding how we know whether something is working in terms of teaching and learning. And so the golden triangle has three corners. One corner is represented by the companies who make educational technology, which increasingly is using artificial intelligence. Another corner is represented is represented by the educators, the people who use the technology. That might also be students. And I don't see educators and students as not necessarily being the same because educators are learning too. So educators and students. And then the third corner, people like me, people who've spent many, many years looking at how we know whether technology is helping to improve teaching and is helping to improve learning. And it's all about bringing those communities together. So what we do, is we help ed tech companies answer the question, how is research evidence relevant to me? And how can I find out what teachers and learners think of my product and how can I test its efficacy? How do I know if it works? And for teachers, how can I find out what works when using technology to support learners, to support my class in my classroom? And how can I use research evidence? And then for researchers, how can I better communicate my research to teachers and companies? How can I demonstrate impact? So everybody's got skin in the game. It's everybody wants to be able to do these things, and if we bring them together, they can all do them much more effectively, and the beneficiaries are people who are learning. So we run this program, we bring cohorts of edtech startups and SMEs into the lab, we provide them with research training, business training, product development training. They learn how to devise a research project about their product or service to work out what data to collect, how to analyze it, how to communicate that to teachers. And then in parallel, we run a teacher program to help teachers learn how to identify a problem in their class that they want to tackle with technology, help them find the technology, and then help them design a study, collect data, analyze it, and communicate it to their peers so that everybody understands whether this technology is effective in this classroom. And this picture here just is an online tool that we have called Lean. And it's important for the edtech startups and SMEs because it combines research and business. If you look at the top um, there, we've got research and business, you have one view which is for business tracking and one view which is research tracking, and they're integrated. So we're trying to build within the edtech community a research mindset, so that they're constantly asking as they're developing their technology, how will I know if this is working? And the same with teachers, not trying to turn them into business people, but trying to help them have a research mindset so that they understand how they can collect data, how they can analyze it, and how they can communicate it to their peers to say, I used this technology, and to be honest, it didn't work, and here's why. Or I used it, it worked in this way, and here's how I know. 
And this will be increasingly important as we have more and more AI technologies within the range of technologies that teachers can use. But it's all about partnerships. So key point three, partnership between educational stakeholders is essential to building capacity. I think one of the big mistakes we've made in the UK is by giving the impression to educators that technology is something that they learn, they tick the box, they say, oh yes, I've done the technology course, that's it. It's just not like that, because it's evolving all of the time. And I think the only way to really help educators is to partner them up with the people who develop the technologies. It's really good for the people developing technologies because they understand much more about teaching and learning. And it's really good for the educators because they start to understand something about the technology and when it comes to AI, that's really important. Now we've worked with 170 edtech startups and SMEs since last June. That is about 20% of the edtech startups and SMEs in the whole of the UK. So that's quite a big proportion. By the end of next year, we'll be up to 30%. And it's all about trying to change that mindset and trying to engage with the educators much more effectively. Right, part four. There are five, by the way, so we're over halfway. I hope everybody's all right. Yeah, looking good. Okay. <laughs> so, solving some of the challenges by redesigning the education system. Now, you, you, you made us realise, I mean, Director, at the start, that this is a very tough area. Policy making is a very difficult area, and I understand that. But I do think that a lot of the education systems in the world aren't actually fit for purpose anymore because of what's happened. It's not that they're fundamentally wrong, they're just <coughs> not right for now. So if I take something like the UK, we still have a system whereby we want students in school to get certain exams, GCSEs when they get to 16, A-levels when they get to 18, and then they go off to university and it's all about a degree, or maybe they go into further education and there's a whole other set of qualifications. But it's all driven by qualifications. The truth of the matter is, now that we've built AI that can learn, we've built systems that can ace those qualifications and just get better and better and better, and they'd never forget. To me, it doesn't seem intelligent to then go on getting their children to do that too. And of course, there's another version of that for the current workforce, because we mustn't forget that we need to make sure that we help everybody, not just the population in school, but focusing on schools for the moment. So we need to gradually start thinking about how we do this. And I think it's all about prioritising the development of our own human intelligence. Because as I said at the start, we've built AI in our own image. But in an image of what we value, we've built it so that it could ace those tests, because that's what we value. And so what we really need to do is think differently about what we value. I'm not saying we don't want anybody to understand history or geography or physics anymore. I'm just saying we need to think about it differently. And I've written this book, Take a One Copy, which is the only one I didn't have room in my suitcase to bring a whole load. Um, but it's called Machine Learning and Human Intelligence, the Future of Education in the 21st Century. And it's very much a much longer version of what I'm going to say in the next five minutes. So this is going to be a very short version. But basically, the crux of it is we need to value the parts of our human intelligence that we haven't traditionally valued because they're the ones that we're going to need more and more and more and more. And that is the compassion. That is the emotional intelligence. That is the social intelligence. That is understanding ourselves as subjective individuals in the world. We have a physical presence. The context that we operate in makes a difference to what we do. Context is really difficult for AR. Really difficult. And yet, we do it often without even realising we're doing it. So I'm standing here in this room talking to you. It's the first time I've been to Turkey, it's the first time I've been in this room. But I know, and you don't need to tell me, that if I suddenly did a headstand in the middle of the floor, you might think I was odd. You know, if I suddenly walked up to one of you and said, no, could you just finish the talk for me? That would be odd. Even though I've not been in this precise space before, I understand some of the rules. That's hard for AI. That's really hard to work out exactly what the cues are and how to know these things. So, but it's something we really take for granted. So it's those things that we haven't valued so much. So 
in one slide. <laughs> it's very complex. And in the book, I do go through a lot of the um, literature from sociology, psychology, computer science to, to back this up. But basically, I think we need to think about human intelligence in a slightly different way because we have artificial intelligence. This is about how we think about human intelligence in an AI world. And I think we can think of it as being, yes, there is this interdisciplinary aggregate <coughs> intelligence. That's the stuff that most of our curricula are made of at the moment. Often it's not very interdisciplinary, often it's quite discipline specific. But if we look around the world, the big problems are being solved by disciplines coming together much more than by individual disciplines. So if we look at cancer and the importance of physics, for example, we wouldn't necessarily have thought of that 20 years ago. So interdisciplinary academic intelligence is important, but it's just one element. We need all of these seven elements, and we need to see how we develop them, not individually, but as an interwoven whole. Social intelligence, hugely important. A good teacher has amazing social intelligence. I know from, I have taught over the years, I've taught in schools, I've taught adults with special needs, which was really hard. I had no training in teaching adults with special needs, but at that time, in further education in the UK, if you were the newest person into the uh, college, you got the job nobody else wanted. And that was it. So you have to learn how to do that. And I've taught some of the brightest students in the world at UCL. And I know social intelligence is fundamental. When I watch good teachers, I know they have it. AI can't do that. Absolutely can't do that. And in the workplace, we talk to employers. Collaborative problem solving is hugely <coughs> important. And you can't do that very well without a fair dose of social intelligence. It's really important. Meta-knowing intelligence. Lots of people would call this epistemology, but it's such a horrible world word, and nobody really likes it, but meta-knowing is somehow better. It's about knowing what knowledge is. I really worry at the moment, because I see people being duped <coughs> by fake news, by information that's just not true, because they don't know how to question. They don't know where knowledge comes from. They don't know what evidence is. How do they know what to believe or not? So rather than teaching students particular elements of history, for example. How do you know how we know about those elements of history? Where does it come from? Why should I believe it? We need people to understand what knowledge is, not just the knowledge. Metacognitive intelligence, fundamental. There's loads and loads of research that demonstrates that people with very sophisticated metacognitive skills do incredibly well in the world. And it's all about knowing what you know understanding how you learn, understanding that you're distracted at the moment and you need to focus, understanding how you might focus better. It's all about that knowing ourselves. We're not naturally necessarily good at it, but we can be. We know we can help students to be good at it. And to subjective intelligence, as I say, that includes our emotional intelligence, but also our physical presence in the world and our understanding of, you know, why do we feel uncomfortable when somebody comes too close to us? That's all part of our physical presence in the world, and we shouldn't undermine that or undervalue it. Metacontextual intelligence, as I say, understanding what we know about different contexts, how we interact differently across different settings and with different individuals. And for me, the most important of all, because it's all of the rest put together, perceived self-efficacy. The most valuable thing, I believe, for the future of the workforce, because it's all about how do I know I can do this thing? How do I know I can meet this goal? How do I meet this goal? Where's my confidence? What knowledge do I need? How do I need to interact? Can I be effective? And is my perception of my ability to be effective accurate? Is it based on hard evidence about what I've done in the past? Do I know myself really well? All of, all of the other six are essential for us to actually have that accurate perceived self-efficacy. So this is very much where I feel we need to focus. So yes, as I said earlier, data is the new oil, and it is the power behind AI, but it's crude, and it needs intelligent humans 
to design and to refine. And I believe we should refine it in intelligence in ways that help us develop those interwoven intelligent elements. And it can. It can't be emotionally intelligent, but it can help us become more emotionally intelligent. It is the magic. It is the way that we can unpack the black box of learning. All those years of teaching for me, and particularly the adults with special needs, are the days, and I'm sure you've had the same, where you think, if only I knew what was going on in their head, if only I work. I know they don't understand, but I can't work out what it is precisely they don't understand. We can actually start to unpack some of that, and that's hugely valuable. We can start to do what I've been doing for many years. This is my little part of the AI patch, if you like, which is student modeling, trying to build accurate models about how a learner is learning. But with a particular focus for me on metacognition, on emotion, on motivation, to see how we can scaffold people towards understanding their own motivation, understanding their own um, ability to learn and their own knowledge. And so we've, over the years, developed various different versions of interfaces that help people understand their progress. This is a really old piece of software. Very, very old. It's not a machine learning AI. It's a really old-fashioned rule-based AI. But even this was really good with primary school learners, helping them understand how to choose an appropriately difficult activity and how to choose the right amount of help to help them be successful. So just a little bit of metacognition. And what was lovely about this is that over the years that we used it, time and time again, different PhD students used it to complete their PhDs. There was one finding that came out all the time, in addition to the, the, the efficacy of the system, was that it was particularly good with students who were struggling. Students who we might have thought wouldn't be able to develop metacognition actually did really well and it helped them. It was all about food chains and food webs and they did particularly well, which was great. So point four, penultimate point. We can use AI to help us be smarter and that's going to be the holy grail. That's going to be the bit that matters because in the same way the game changer for AI has been that it can learn. The game changer for us will be the realisation that we can become much, much, much more sophisticated. We shouldn't let it dumb us down, which is a danger. It has to be what makes us smarter. So, finally, solving some of the challenges, last point, educating everyone about AI, which I tried to do a little bit of that right at the start by the history of AI and trying to help people understand what it is. Of course, we need to do slightly more than that. But it's not so much about getting everybody to be able to build AI systems. Yes, there are some people. We will need a subset of the population to understand enough about AI in its technical terms to, to write good algorithms, to write good systems. We will need that, but it's actually only a small percentage. Because apart from anything else, AI is already starting to build itself. A lot of the emphasis in the UK has been on helping students to learn to code, to write computer programs. I think it's a valuable activity, but it's actually quite limited. Because the honest truth is, my grandson who's five, what he learns to write now, we won't be using in 10 years time. Getting him to think in the right way to understand what an algorithm is, and how you break down a problem, how you think about things in the way that helps you to work out what the program should be that you code, yes, very useful. So if that's happening as well, and the code is the bit that makes it come to life, fine, but it needs to be done in a very particular way. So I have this little tree diagram that I've tried to kind of break down what I think we probably need to focus on in this bit. And I think there are some people we do need to teach to build up for future AI systems, and that's important. And we also need to make sure they understand the ethics of it and what's responsible. One of the problems that we have at the moment in AI systems is because people haven't taken in the least bit enough notice of the data that's been used to train algorithms. And the reason some of these algorithms are making bad decisions, for example, not recognising black faces as people, is because they've been trained on the wrong data. That's a human error. The reason the Amazon recruitment bot fell over, as I've said, was because it had been trained on data that 
all came from male job applicants, so it wasn't surprising that it then matched. <coughs> when you look at it after the effect, it sounds really daft, but hey, it happened. You know, so we need to make sure that it's not just about the technology and the techniques, it's also about the ethics. It's also about the bigger picture. It, it mustn't be done in a vacuum. And then we need people to understand the skills they'll need in order to work with AI, because that's going to be the future. It's not really going to be about jobs being replaced by AI in automated systems. Yes, there will be some where that will happen. And it won't necessarily happen in the, in the way that we anticipate. But actually, for most of us, it's much more likely that our jobs will be done with an AI. I like Howard Gardner's work on multiple intelligences, and I particularly like his notion of the synthesizing mind. And I think that's where we'll be for the future. But the synthesizing mind won't just be mine, it'll be mine and yours and yours and yours and an AI bot too. And we'll all be trying to work out together how we pool our knowledge, our expertise, our understanding, our skills to solve a particular problem. So everybody will need to understand enough about AI in order to work with it effectively. Um, and I think we do need to teach people that the AI is not there to make them dumber. I really worry that we will allow AI to do the things we don't like doing. And we will therefore just sit back and think, oh, I don't need to worry about that. It's all right, I've got an AI. Now, as a commercial um, entrepreneur, which I'm not, but if I was, I could imagine that it would be quite nice to go to people and say, you know, you know that calculus you find really hard to do, well, you never need to do it ever, ever again in your life, because we've got a system that can do that. Actually, in the case of calculus, maybe that's not too much of a problem, but actually, maybe we need to understand what it is and what its role is and, and where it fits within maths and, and when you use it and when you don't. It's not just about <coughs> offloading the things that we don't like. It's about being careful about what we offload onto our AI. I do a talk based on a very famous um, human resources book called Who Moved My Intelligence, <coughs> which is called Who Moved My Intelligence. And I think we need to think about that in two ways. Do we want to move our intelligence from here to the computer or do we want to move our intelligence to be ever more sophisticated because we have the computer? And it has to be that we go that way. But I think it's a risk because, let's face it, we're inherently lazy. That you know, those things we don't like doing, if we can automate them, we might just automate them. And we need to think carefully about whether the things that we should automate or not. So I do think this understanding of AI is fundamental to everybody, and I do think it needs to be everybody. Because Yes, it's important so that they can use AI effectively and they can keep safe. Because we'll never be able to regulate everything about AI and data to protect everybody. It's impossible. Because regulation can't keep up with the technology. And there'll always be somebody with bad motives who wants to do something harmful. So the only way is to have regulation and education. We have to do both. So, Key point five, we need to recognise the urgency in increasing everybody's understanding about AI. And we can use AI to help us do that. We can use AI to help people understand AI. We can help people see how an AI system works by playing with an AI system. I get my grandson to work with Alexa to try and work out when Alexa understands what he says and when Alexa doesn't understand what he says. What, what he says. And I said to him, he's five, last week, I said, do you know what Alexa is? And he said, of course I know what Alexa is, Granny goes. Alexa's a software program, it's an AI. <laughs> <laughs> you know that? <laughs> wonderful, I love your children, they're so wonderful. Well, I was really pleased that you knew that. But it's interesting, helping <laughs> him see when Alexa understands, when it doesn't. Helping him to understand. So even at a young age, we can start helping people to understand, and it's really important that we do. So my five key points, and then I shall stop and answer any questions, I hope. Um, artificial intelligence is intelligent, but in a very, very particular sort of a way. Not like this, and this can be so much more. Artificial intelligence can help us solve some of our biggest challenges. The possibilities are enormous. An individualised education with a combination of AI and human tutors from across the world for every person in the world. Amazing. 
partnership between education and stakeholders is essential for building capacity. Because the AI industry needs that as much as the educators need it, and we must broker those partnerships. We can use AI to make us smarter, but we have to realise that it's about us being smarter. And we have to help people understand AI. We really do. I think we have to get AI and data literacy on the curriculum as fast as we possibly can so that at least young people understand it. And then we mustn't forget the workforce, the current workforce, because we don't want them to be left in a difficult place in the future. So if I really think about this diagram, the green one is really the possibilities. Let's solve our difficult educational challenges. And in a way, these are the challenges and the ways that we need to address them. Education capacity, AI industry capacity for developing anything that's useful in education. Big challenge, but we can address it. Inadequate education systems, we can address it if we start valuing the parts of our human intelligence that we haven't traditionally valued and the ones that we can't automate, we haven't automated, and for many reasons I believe we won't ever automate. And if we do start educating people about AI so that they know how to use it effectively. And I shall stop now and say thank you once again. And I love you. Does that help to answer your question? 
ülkeler bu yapay zeka konusunda geri. Mesela Türkiye gibi. Ee, şimdi buradan bir örnek vereyim. Türkiye'nin e, hisse senedi piyasası İstanbul Merkul Kıymetler yurt dışındaki bir takım brokerlar ya da yapay zekalı sistemler tarafından ele geçirilmiş. 
Just ne yapmamız lazım? Sorry, could you start again? I've only just got the English translation. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. <gülüyor> uh, ya Türkiye gibi daha az gelişmiş ülkeler, teknolojide daha az gelişmiş. Mikrofon çalışıyor mu? Çalışıyor. Uh, gelişmiş ülkeler nereden başlamalı? Uh, bir bunu örnek vereyim. İstanbul Mekul Kıymetler Borsası algoritmalarla oynayan brokerlar tarafından işgal edilmiş durumda. Siz oynadığınız zaman kaybediyorsunuz. Yani mekul kıymetler oynamak şu anda çok büyük zorluk gerektiriyor. Türk eğitim sistemi bu yabancı ülkelerin geliştirdiği programların esiri mi olacak? Teşekkür ederim. Hmm. <gülüyor> oh, I really hope not. <gülüyor> um, the best way to stop that happening is to educate people to understand what the artificial intelligence is doing. It really is, because the sad truth is there will always be people who do want to do inappropriate things, do want to hack the technology. Um, and although cyber security is becoming more sophisticated and we're getting better at dealing with hackers, they'll always be there. So I think it is really important that people do understand enough to keep themselves safe. It would be awful if the education system was subverted by some other less well-intentioned um, authority. And I do think that is a genuine risk, if we're not careful. But that's why having conferences like this is so important. You know, you're waking up to the fact that this thing is here and it has got huge potential benefits. But yes, there are risks and we have to face up to them. I hate facing up to them, by the way, because I don't like thinking negatively, but we have to. In the UK, um, last month, I launched with two of my colleagues, the first in the world, actually, certainly the first in the UK, um, Institute for Ethical Artificial Intelligence in Education, precisely because we are worried about what you're talking about about education being used as a vehicle for less positive uses of AI. So we do have to be careful, but the best way of being careful is through education. I don't know where the next is. One here and one here and one over there. But <laughs> Sorry, the introduction and your your presentation with respect to the point of view you raised is rather understandable. It's a uh, it's an esteemable uh, objective to try to train everyone through AI. But the AI's uh, isolationary effect is something that we have to consider. We need nowadays we we see uh, cartoons, for example people sitting together and writing to each other messages. I write my wife message from downstairs when she's upstairs. You know, this is, this is very, very threatening to society. People are forgetting how to inter interconnect, how to communicate. Children are, are forgetting, are not learning how to play games. What are we going to do? I agree. What is your proposal? But that's where I say about focusing on the human intelligence that's not automatable, because that is the social intelligence, that is the emotional intelligence, that is the physical games. The, I think if we get it right, we can do more of those things in our education system. And I think that's important that we do. Because there is a risk that we lose the ability to socially interact effectively if we just do everything through technology. My vision for the future um, of education is not one that's all about the technology. It's actually all about the humans. But the technology enables us to spend more time in the human interaction. Because we can do some of the, you know, the, the, the, the tutoring type interaction of the basics in a very individualized way through the technology but we have to add much greater value to the other human intelligences that are not just about academic knowledge because they're the ones that are enriched by those human social interactions i'd like it to be that we did less of that speaking via te technology not more 
But we have to value that. We have to give it a value in our education systems so that it's something that is seen, if you like, as currency for the future. Çok teşekkür ederiz. Tamam. E, sunumunuz için çok teşekkür ederiz. Nihat Bülbül bilişim eğitmeni. Yani hem bilişimi biliyor hem eğitimini biliyor. 25 yıldır bu işin içinde. E, ben 10 yıl öncesinde e, bu yapay zeka ile ilgili çalışmaları kendim düşünmüştüm. E, yapabileceğim şekilde. Fakat şu anda e, kısaca e, fazla uzatmadan bir şeyler söyleyeceğim. Ee, bizim gibi az gelişmiş ülkelerdeki insanların korktukları tek bir şey var. Makine bizim yerimize geçer mi? Ben bunu e, günlerce düşündüm. Ve bunu nasıl aşabiliriz şeklinde? Ve şöyle bir şey, e, kendi okullarımızda e, özellikle 3-4 yıl bir e, pilot bir çalışma yaptık. Makineleri, yapay zekaya, e, makinelere yapay zekayı kazandırmak yerine bir adım geri gelerek, bir adım geri gelerek insanlarımıza düşünmelerini sağlayacak duygusal zeka ve sosyal zekayı verdiğimizde o zaman insanlar makineleri araç olarak kullanan bir e, insan oluyor. Yani düşünebilen ve makineleri istediği amaca göre yönlendirebilen bir insan oluyor. E, bunu da ee, insanların korkusu şu e, makine yapay zekalı bir makine benim yerime düşünür. Çünkü şu andaki teknoloji şu andaki teknoloji insanlarımızı özellikle Türkiye'de ben buradaki bütün eğitimci arkadaşlara söylüyorum e, Türkiye'de insanların düşünmesini zayıflatıyor. Ezber eğitim şeklinde şeklinde zorunlu eğitim şeklinde şeklinde bunu e, yapay zekada e, özetlemek gerekirse kullanıcıya duygusal zeka artı sosyal zekayı birleştirip bu veri ambarını tutup kullanıcıya düşünmesini sağlayan bir insan yarattığımızda gerisi geliyor. İnsan kendisi düşündüğünde makineden daha ileri bir şekilde hayatına devam edebilir ve makineye de e, kontrolü makineye de vermemiş olur diye e, düşünüyorum. E, bu arada e, tekrar teşekkür ediyorum bu bilgilerinizde dolayı. Thank you. Yes, I'm trying to stay near the microphone. I do agree that emotional intelligence and social intelligence are so important. I completely agree that emotional and social intelligence is really important. But I think in terms of thinking skills, which I also agree are very important, um, part of what we haven't done, and I'm saying this for the UK education system, um, I'm not criticizing the Turkish education system because I don't know it well enough, um, <laughs> but certainly in the UK, we have not done enough to help students understand what knowledge is. So we really haven't helped them to question. In fact, we've done anything but helping them to question. We very much wanted them to see knowledge as something that comes from their teacher, from books, from software, and not something that they have to create for themselves that's relative to where they are, that's something you question, not all the time, but you know when to question it. You know where knowledge comes from and how to make decisions about whether you should believe something or you shouldn't believe something. What evidence is. Those are the things that we really need to do more of as well to help students understand how to use the thinking machines, if you like, more effectively so that they have a more sophisticated understanding of knowledge than the AI, as well as a more sophisticated understanding of humanity because they are human and they are emotionally intelligent and socially intelligent. I was very struck recently. Um, we had a very horrible incident in the UK, a very bad fire. 
in London um, a couple of years ago. Lots of people died, and it was really, really awful. It was a big tower block and, and a horrible, horrible thing. And our Prime Minister didn't go to meet the people whose family had died. She went to the site of the accident, but just met the people in the fire service and the police. And the people were very, very upset that she hadn't spoken to them. And there was a big protest, and the banners said, Theresa May, is the name of our Prime Minister, where is your humanity? And I thought that was really interesting, because what she did lacked emotional intelligence. And that's the thing that people wanted. They didn't actually want facts and figures and lots of information. They wanted somebody to show them that they cared. She didn't read their emotions and that social situation well. And I think that was not intelligent. Do you see what I mean? It's really important that we get those things right. Machines can learn the information, the numbers, the stuff. They can't learn how to get that emotional interaction right. Mm -hmm. so it's really important, I agree. Okay. Wherever the microphone goes. Dear, dear Professor, thank you very much for the kind presentation. Actually, it's very useful for me or for audience. Uh, I have a general question about artificial intelligence. As you know, very si uh, famous scientist Stephen Hawking so pessimistic yes. about artificial in intelligence. I would like to learn your opinion about artificial intelligence in, in the future of education. Thank you very much. I and mean, he was very pessimistic about the future, <laughs> and in actual fact, um, it's people like him who motivated myself and my two colleagues to launch our institute last month, because there is no question that AI could be used for really bad purposes. You know, I'm not going to lie about that, because that's the truth. But the best way of stopping that is by having an educated population that understands enough about AI to try and prevent that from happening, to make sure the humans stay in charge, to make sure there is always a human in the loop, which there is at the moment. But, you know, we need within our young people to make sure that some of them really understand the implications of AI so that they can become the people in the future who protect the population. We need the people who are currently in that position to understand enough about AI to protect the population. So it still comes down to education. I mean, it, it's education about AI as much as AI for education and training. If I look at what happened in the US and in the UK when Facebook was challenged over what happened with the firm called Cambridge Analytica um, about a year ago now. It was perfectly obvious that the majority of the politicians asking the questions did not understand enough to doubt the answers they were given. Because some of the answers were disingenuous, to put it politely. They really weren't fair, they weren't true. But the people asking the questions didn't understand enough to hold Facebook to account. That's quite worrying for the future. So we need to educate people enough about AI so that people currently in decision-making positions do understand enough to question. And people in the future who are going to be in those places know enough. Do you see what I mean? I think it's fundamentally important, which is why I say it's really urgent that we we can educate people about AI now. And in the process, we can also help them to use it effectively, and that will then help us to develop better AI. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you very much. It's been really nice.
bir tedmem kürsünün daha sonuna geldik. Tekrar e, Rozmer Bakın'a teşekkür ediyorum bu sunumu için. E, gerçekten çok doyurucu ve bilgilendirici bir sunum oldu. Ayrıca sizlere teşekkür ediyorum burada. E, bugün bu paylaşımda hazır bulunduğunuz ve zaman ayırdığınız için. Şimdi e, Rozmer Bakın'a e, bugünkü katkıları için bir e, teşekkür belgesi ve e, Türkiye Eğitim Derneği'nin bir hediyesini sunuyoruz. Thank <laughs> you.